that note and go back into study and to meditate. So this is a story where Jesus was invited to a house by the Pharisees. And he went into the house and he was there. And the Bible says that the woman heard that he was in the house. And you know what she did? She heard and she eagerly, with expectation, she ran to the house. She went to the house. Why? Because she saw the value in Jesus. So she heard and she came. And the Bible says she came and she went and she wept. She knelt down and she wept at his feet and she was crying. And she washed his feet with her tears. And then she dried it with her hair. And then she anointed him with oil. When I think about that story, I think about the intimacy. Doesn't that sound intimate? She was crying. Just imagine her kneeling down at his feet. She was crying. Then she took her hair and she was using it to wipe his feet, to wipe it dry. She's kneeling down. She wiped it dry. And then she proceeded to come and to take out an alabaster box, she took a, a jar. And I went to do some research on this jar. Do you know they say that the jar is estimated of one year's wage? So they were saying around, around 40 to 50K. I mean, that's before this whole inflation. That's another message for another day. We're not gonna talk about that. How much money we need for daily living. But around 40 to 50,000 thereabout, one year's wage that she poured on the feet of Jesus. And, I, and it really set me thinking, I'm like, wow. And then, and then I went to look and it says that this type of alabaster box, this is something that people normally save for the anointing of her husband on her wedding night. So this, bo- this, this jar that she had, she was saving it to anoint her husband. Who's our, who's our husband? is Jesus, amen? He's our first husband. It says anoint, it, it's there to anoint the, her husband on the wedding night. So much intimacy. And then it said, and it was also was meant to represent the total gift of herself. So when she was coming to the feet of Jesus, she was giving everything, say everything. She was giving everything, there was no holding back. Listen, you cannot do that unless your heart is involved. You cannot give a total year's wages unless your heart is there. You can't. People struggle to give $5. So how are you giving a whole year of wages? But for her, it was nothing. For her, it was easy. Why? Because it was, it was, she was giving her, her whole self to him. That is deep connection. Say deep connection. And you can't do it with the heart. You know what's also interesting when I was looking at it? Was the response of the Pharisees. Because he was looking at all this happening. And all he was thinking was, if Jesus only knew who this lady was, he he wouldn't be allowing this. And I was really meditating on that, and I was thinking on that, and I was like, listen, you know what? That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants people to be in God's presence and be disconnected. He wants people to be in the presence of God and not to allow, not to have their heart involved. The Pharisee was literally there. He was analyzing everything. And Jesus came to him and he said, listen, I'm going to tell you a story. There was someone that owed a debt of 550 and and then another person of 50. They were both forgiven. He said, which one do you think would love more? And he's like, well, naturally the one that had the bigger debt. And he said, yes. So when we're forgiven of much, we love much, amen? And so the enemy wants to harden the heart. He wants there to be no connection, and that's exactly what the Pharisee says, what he, what he went through, because Jesus is like, as soon as I came in, he says, at no point did you do even what it was custom to do. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't kiss me. You didn't anoint me. He's like, you didn't even do the things that you were taught to do as a custom, as a religious practice. But this woman came in and she just, she was loving on me, she was loving on me. What was the difference between that woman and Pharisees? It was the heart, say the heart. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 15. This is a perfect example of it. Matthew 15, eight, verse nine. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He says, they worship me in vain. How could someone be worshiping in vain? How can someone honor God with their lips, 
but their heart be far. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. He says, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So you know what that is, what he's talking about? Religion. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants people to come to church and to be religious. He wants us just to be professional churchgoers. That's all that he wants. Yep, just to tick the box. That's what religion is. Religion is serving God with no heart. That's, that's what Satan, he's content with that. Satan didn't, he didn't care that the Pharisees was in the, literally the same room as Jesus. It didn't bother him. Why? Because he was still missing out. But who did, the, who did the enemy want to be attacked? It was the woman. Because the thoughts already started working in the Pharisees' minds, right? Oh, look at this woman. She was the one that was being under attack. Why? Because her heart was being engaged. Her heart was involved. So the arrows were not set at the Pharisees. The arrows were set at the woman that came to connect with her Savior. So if you're coming to church, yeah, sometimes... Expect things to come up, but you have to be strong. That's where the focal, you know, discipline comes in that we're learning. You have to be able to fight them off. Because the mere fact that you want to worship God with your heart, that you want to serve him, the enemy is not going to be happy with that. But you have to push through. Tell your neighbor, push through. And why do we push through? Because, listen, God deserves it. God loves it. But Satan is against it. And when love is involved, even the things that seem hard, you know, God says, my commandments are not grievous. And I remember years ago, you know, when I read that, I was laughing. I'm like, they're not? <laughs> they're not grievous. Sometimes to our flesh, they feel so challenging. But when love is there, you know, we were at Spirit, uh, not Spirit, what was it? Prayer Mountain yesterday, and Papa was praying, and he was talking about Jacob, and he's like, for seven years, you know, Jacob, he labored for, he labored for Rachel, and it felt us a few days, and I was really thinking about it, and I was like, wow, the power of love, that you can, like, think about it, guys. This is where meditation comes in. You're laboring for something for seven years. So imagine we start today. In the next seven years, you're going to get what you set your eyes out to. So wherever you are today, think of something that's valuable that you love or, you know, and, or even you're serving God and then the fruit of it is not till seven years. How many give up in that time? It says seven years and it felt like a few days. So then I started, I was like, Lord, I've been kind of saved for around, for math reasons, around 21 years. So I'm like, I'm at like a weekish when it comes to love. So my service should be so pumped up because technically, because of God's love, I should be moving at a speed of I just served him for the last week. And that was challenging me. I was looking as I was meditating, I was looking at my service, I was looking at what I was doing for God, and I was like, technically, if seven years equals a few days, and I'm at around like a little bit under 21, I'm, I've been technically for like a week and a half. And I, now I come to you and tell you I'm tired after a week and a half. And God was challenging me. I was like, Lord, I, I, I receive grace. Because when it's love, you can do and do and do and do and do. And that's how he wants us to serve him. Not grumbling, not complaining. And even in God's wisdom, you know what? He, he sets relationships here on earth physically so we can kind of grasp and comprehend. So he has unions like marriage or, you know, father and, and child or whatnot. So we can kind of grasp what he's talking about. So I know what it's like to do things when their heart is not involved. It's hard. It seems long. It's drawn out. But when you love someone, you can do things anytime. You keep going, keep going, keep going. And it's like you literally, you don't feel it. That's the same way that God wants us to be with him. Say, Lord, I give you my heart. And I want to quote something that Papa said. He says, the devil wants to make it possible that people don't know or feel love. And he also says, the devil works on people's hearts. So by the time that they hear God loves you, it means nothing. I'm going to say that again. The devil works on people's hearts. So by the time that they hear that God loves them, it means nothing. People's hearts have been so hardened. And the problem is that they try to bring that hardened heart to church. And then they try to serve God with that hardened heart. 
or the heart that's been damaged, that's been battered, that's been bruised, that, that's the type of heart that they want to give to God and say, Lord, here I am to worship. He's like, no, no. That's why the very thing at the beginning, he says in Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, I've given you a new heart. We need a new one. He says, I've given you a new heart. I've given you a new spirit because the one that was damaged by the world, I can't use that. I can't connect with that. People's hearts that are damaged, that are broken, that are bruised, it brings them to damaged relationships. If the heart is broken, if the heart is damaged, the relationships, they will automatically break down. They will. So God knowing that, he, the first thing he said is, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit so that you can love me from the depths of your being, that you can feel me, that you can enjoy me. He sent his very, think about it, he sent his very best for us. If that's not an extension of love, I don't know what it is. The very best that he had was his son, Jesus Christ. He said, you know what, all these people, they're worth dying for. He so desired a relationship with us that he would give his best so that he can have us back. Why? Because he wants fellowship. Say fellowship. He wants that deep, deep connection. And there's a word, I think it's either from the Greek or the, um, the Hebrew. Is it Greek? Thank you so much. And it is koinonia. So God, you know, a new heart is needed to enjoy God's love. So we can experience what's called koinonia or deep fellowship. And I looked up what that means. It means communion. It means intimacy. It means joint participation. When you're in a relationship with God, it's not supposed to be one-sided. It's joint participation. It's, it's, it's him, you know, ministering to you, us ministering back to him. It's him, he's giving to you, we're giving back to him. And that's why I wanted to start with that story with the woman with the alabaster box. You could see that she was responding to his love. Her response to his love was worship. Her response to his love was being all in, being totally committed, being fully yielded. That was her, her, her response to his love. And that's all that he asked for us, is for our heart. And so three, way, three keys to a deeper fellowship. Number one is to receive your new heart that you have in Christ. And I talked about that you know, in Ezekiel 36. So it's not just about the emotions of church. It's not just about coming to church and just doing whatever, whenever. It's about not only bringing your body to church, but bringing your heart to church. <laughs> don't just bring your body, don't just bring your mind, bring your body. And that requires discipline on every level. Some people bring their body and their mind is on the grocery store. And their heart is on what someone said yesterday. So you got one out of the three. Some people, they come, they bring their body, and they bring their mind. But their heart is somewhere else. This is where the discipline comes in. Where you, when you bring your body here, bring your mind, and bring your heart. If we're going to be here for two hours, let it be, Lord, these are two hours I separate for you. Don't be checking business emails and all those things while you're in church because it's not going to work. How many would actually want to be in a relationship with someone? You're sitting down and you're talking. And as you're talking to them, they're like, mm-hmm, yep. How many would want that? You would want that? No. Oh, I'm like, oh, okay. See the counseling department. Um, no, but nobody would want that. When someone's not engaged and uninvolved, no, 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 you don't want that. You want someone's undivided attention. It's the same thing. When we come to church, we come giving all. Come expecting, ready to see Jesus. I remember like months ago, I think it was last month, Papa was like, if you really think that you're coming to see Jesus, there will be no reason to miss it. And it's true. You call people and say, oh, you come to church, I'm not feeling well. Jesus is the healer. So if you knew that he was running a crusade in 377 Mackenzie and you weren't feeling well, you're going you're gonna to either come or like in the Bible where he had his friends, right? They picked him up and he brought him in, like any way to get there. But again, it comes back to what do we believe? So the first thing for deep fellowship is our heart is needed. It's not just about the emotions. It's not just about the emotion, checking off the box. It's bringing your heart. Say, Lord, when I come to worship you, 
I will worship you with my whole heart in Jesus' name. So God always deals with people according to their heart. You can write 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Saul was looking, and Samuel was looking on the outside, and he's like, no, 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 I don't look at the outward appearance. I don't look how man looks. I look at the heart. So God is looking at our heart, and he wants this deep connection. He wants this fellowship. And number two is not just our heart, but he, a healed heart. Say healed heart. And in order for the heart to establish a deep connection, it has to be healed. It has to be healed. So that's part of it. And that's where his, his goodness comes in. He heals the hearts. When God wants to heal hearts, you know what he does? He shows his love and kindness. He says his goodness leads people to repentance. He draws you in. He's the healer of hearts. He's near to the brokenhearted. When we have pain in our heart, he actually wants to be the physician to heal and to help. So you can, like we were doing earlier, you can cast your burdens on him. You can bring your pains. Don't run away from him. That's what Adam did. That's the Adamic nature. That's what I used to do. The more hurt I was, the more I'd run away. It's like, it didn't make any sense. Until you learn to run to him because he is the healer. So the second thing is to be able to have that deep connection is to receive that healed heart. And some of the healing, it, most of it happens in his presence. Counseling's good. I'm a fan of counseling. I'm a counselor. But there's only so much that talking can do. Mama said before, there's only, you know, talking cannot change a life. You need God. You need his presence. I've had more healing in his presence alone one-on-one -on -one, than sometimes sitting in counseling offices. Things that I didn't even know I needed to be healed from that were lurking deep within, subconsciously, things that I didn't even know were there. I thought it was A, and God's like, actually, it's over here. But I didn't know, But because he, he knows us better than we know ourselves. So who am I to go to my maker and say, this is what I need? He's like, no, 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 you think you need that but this is what you really need. So we run to him and he heals our heart. That's number two. And number three, when the heart is healed, it says a grateful heart is a loving heart. When we are grateful, when we practice gratitude, when we practice, you know, focusing on the good things. And I was laughing when Papa was saying, and I'm gonna wrap up, if we're gonna have the worship team. Um, I was laughing because he was like, you know, when people come to church, it's like they have the evil eyes, you know, and you, all you see is what's wrong. You know, it's like, oh, just lift up your eyes to the Lord. And you're like, why are those lights like that? Why is there a this? Why is there a that? He's like, it's an evil eye. It made me laugh because it's like, it happens. He's like, people focus on things that just disturb, disturb their soul. If you don't like someone's haircut, stop staring at it. Stop looking at it. You don't like the way the person does it, don't focus on it. But some people, they come into church and they only, they're like, listen, that stain's been there for weeks. So go get a thing and clean it. It's simple. If you don't like how something is, and that's the thing, like when we're working with people, it's like, it's so easy. You know what I found? And I think mom and pop have said this before, but I'm gonna wrap up. When you're not a part of something, it's so easy to criticize it. When you're not a part, you know, when you've actually invested in something, you spent your hours, your sweat, your tears, even if the thing is kind of crooked, you're like, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is class, <laughs> you know, because you were putting in, you know, it might not be perfect, but you're like, this is good. This is good. You know, like I was doing some work on a room and I knew that, you know, the painting was not beautiful. Like it wasn't what it needs to be, but I'm like, ah, this is good, because my hair, my hair is normally curly. When I sweat, it, it from straight to curly, and I'm gonna tell you something, when I was painting that place, my hair was curly. Paint was spilling, and I, I don't like to paint, but I painted, and I was like, at the end, I'm like, this is good. If, if the person moves a desk, there's no paint behind the desk, because I'm like, listen, this is what I could do. But I put my heart into it, and the thing is, is that I looked at it, I'm like, this is good. Right? And so when you're not a part of something, it's so easy to walk in and be like, oh, look at this, look at this, look at that. But I guarantee you, put, your, put yourself, start working. Be a part of something. If you see things that are broken, whatever, take some time. Oh, can I come to church? Can I do this? Can I do that? Or you see someone keeps doing the same thing. Oh, can I spend time with you? Let's go out. Let's talk. You'll find you'll be more forgiving, more loving, more understanding, more invested. 
And that's what God wants. He wants our heart to be grateful. So yes. it, it might not be everything. Everything might not be the way you want it, but find something to be grateful for. I told someone last week, I'm like, okay, yeah, there's things that we have to work on and whatnot, but let's celebrate what's good. Focus on what's good. What do we do good here? We pray for sure. We push you to the word for sure. There's some things that you can say without a shadow of doubt that if I need to learn, I will learn here in Chogi for sure. You know anytime you go to Papa and Mama, they're going to tell you to pray. Or they're going to send you on a three-day, you know, sanctified fast. They're going to do something. Why? Because that's what we have here. So let's enjoy it. Let's make the most of it. Let's be grateful for what God has given us now, for giving us here. And then you'll see his work. You'll see his word. You'll see himself in a new light. Amen. So I'm going to round up Psalms 86 verse 12. And let's rise to our feet. It says, I will give thanks to you. Oh Lord my God with my whole heart and I will glorify your name forever say Lord I give thanks to you Lord, I give thanks thanks to with you. my whole heart I glorify your name with my whole heart thank you Father for this new heart that I have in Christ Jesus I reject the old heart and I receive a new heart a heart of gratitude a heart of thanksgiving a heart of love just receive it right now Father we thank you Lord Lord we receive it receive that new heart thank you Lord we receive it we receive it Ma Father we thank you Lord thank you Lord we receive it thank you Lord Father we thank you Lord and if you have yet to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior or maybe you're saying you know what that was who I, you know, I used to love God, or I used to serve Him, but something has shifted along the way because things come to attack our heart. If that is you, just say, Jesus, Jesus. I, ask you. I ask you, I ask for the forgiveness, 